I say it often. I, I seldom, I don't know if I have ever seen somebody leap and weep at the same time. It's just your legs are linked to that. Your legs are like your happy button. The Bible says leap for joy. And the reason some people never happy, I've never seen them leap in my life. And them, them are some of the most miserable people. But I'm going to tell you something. If you ever, that's why the devil don't want you leaping. Because he likes you weeping. But the devil is, and he's under your feet. And he's, some of y'all use him for a footrest. I use him for a punching bag, for a kicking. And stomping on the devil makes me happy, Brother Tommy. That's why it says leap for joy. I don't know. You just can't leap and weep. You can get up and start shouting, moving your feet. And all of a sudden, your face is linked to that shout. You, you, you think I'm lying. Stop. The devil's the liar. I'm telling you the truth. You ought to just try it. You ought to just, you say, well, I can't get up high. Get the back of your foot up like that right there. Just try that and see if it don't do something to your heart. I don't know. It's just, it's just the biology of the Bible. Bible biology. You, 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 you leap, you get happy. Your taste buds are te- connected to your eyelids. Your eyeball. They'll taste and see. Amen. That the Lord is good. Come on. It's just a connection there. I don't know how he does it, but it's just great, isn't it? Genesis 12. Familiar passage on a Sunday night. I'm thankful for the word of the Lord. Aren't you thankful for the word of the Lord? So glad I look back and saw Brother Smith here from Pinehurst, our neighbor, neighboring bishop. And I'm thankful he's here. Thankful we have great, great apostolic churches. We're kind of spoiled in this utopian area of Southeast Texas where you are this really the only place I think that I'm, I'm aware of in the world where you can be a picky Pentecostal. It's like a buffet, you know. But that's a good thing. We want the whole world to be like that. We want every city you go into that you can choose. Come on. Do you want, do you want it the wild, crazy, tick you off preacher? Do you want to go a little bit more? Whatever. You know, you got your choice. Amen. So if y'all complain, I can be like, you picked. You know what I mean? You picked it. You picked me. So, uh, no, I believe I believe so much, and I'm so thankful that we're in this together, and thankful for the neighbors that we have that love this great truth. Amen. Genesis 12 and 1. If you're there, say amen. amen. I want to also say, Sister Mary Swagger. Uh, uh, something we failed to mention her, and I I want to say how much we love and appreciate the Swagger family. What an incredible woman of faith. I tell you, I can't wait to get to heaven to see Sister Swagger. Well, I never knew her with the capability really to, to function, but I heard she was quite the worshiper and shouter and dancer. And so we're going to have a good time in heaven. Amen. Genesis 12 and 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into the land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We're on a journey of faith. I want to talk to you about the journey of faith. Father, I thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, and for your people, your word. Let me, Father, deliver it clearly in the name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. Genesis chapter 12, one of the most famous in the Old Testament, no doubt, and one of my favorite. It is much that has transpired from Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 12, Adam and Eve have committed the first sin, Eve, by the Bible says she looked at this tree and saw that it was desirous. She lusted with her eyes and and she sinned. And sin is simply the breaking of the law. John tells us that sin is disobeying God's law. Look at your neighbor and say, sin is disobeying the law. So if the law, this is the law, if the word of God says do and you don't, you sin. If the word of the Lord says don't and you do, you have committed a sin. It is quite simple. Sin is the breaking of the law, and that's what she did. She broke the law. It was singular law, not laws. All she had to do, all they had to do, was not partake of the fruit, but they did. And so if sin is the disobedience of the law, then we know that faith simply could be defined as the obedience of the law. If you can sin by breaking it, you can believe by obeying it. It, Come on, faith is not, come on, always agreeing with it. Faith isn't saying when I understand it. Faith is saying I'm going to obey it. 
And your life can be a whole lot better if you just look at this book and say, if it says it, I'll do it. If it says don't do it, I'll do it. I promise you, every problem that you're in for the most part is linked to the fact you just ain't doing what's in the book. But if you do what's in the book, come on, if you do what's in the book, it works. It works, it works, it works. It much, and if, you could, if we could get that, if I could ever just get that into us, we could dismiss the service tonight. All you gotta do to make it is look at this book. If it says do it, do it. If it says don't, don't. It'll help you out a whole lot, amen? Your life will be better. My life will be better. And so God said don't eat of the fruit, they ate of it. Then of course, you know, the, book, the story continues. Before we get to chapter 12, Cain is killed Esau. Cain was a believer. He wasn't an unbeliever. He had the spirit that said, I believe, but I'm gonna do it my way. I, it's not that I don't believe in God. I just don't believe it takes all the blood. I don't think it takes all the sacrifice, so I'm going to do it the easy way. Now, I can, you can believe your way, and I'll believe my way. And God said, sin is at the door. Why? Because that's disobedience to God. Amen? You don't get to believe your way. You only get to believe this way. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not an agreement. I'm going to say it again. Your journey of faith is simply this, young people. Obey the book. Obey the book. I said, obey the book. Obey the book. Obey the book. Obey the book. But the spirit of Cain is one that's disobedient to God, believes its own way. I'll do what I want to, however I want to. But instead of getting mad at God, it instantly gets mad at its brother. And it kills, it kills the one trying to do right. Uh, you're going to come across some people like that in your life. And then you continue reading. And, and the world grows. Population of the world after 10 generations from Adam is now at, at probably around 50 million people, historians say. And then it is one of great wickedness. Even after Seth, who has walked after the ways of the Lord, now 10 generations later, it is so that the, the world is filled with wickedness. The Bible says God looks down in one of the saddest verses in the Bible and says it repented him that he had even made and he even started on the project. And tears are, are, are present if they were in heaven, if I can say it that way. And he looks down and, and says, I'm going to destroy it all. And then following the saddest verse is one of the most beautiful verses in your Bible in Genesis chapter 6. And it says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that in the darkness of that generation, there was a man who found grace. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God uh, that hath appeared unto all men? Uh, come on, that saving grace, uh, it appeared unto Noah. Now, it, 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 let me tell you, Noah found grace, but that didn't mean he didn't have to do anything. Grace came in the form of instruction. Come on. Grace was not a way out, a, a, an excuse. It was not a bypass. It was, a, it was an instructor. Amen? It wasn't, a, it wasn't a passport. He showed and said, I just, you know what? I'm, I'm just, I've got grace, so, so I'm not, I don't have to do anything. No, grace said build an ark. And you build the ark the way I say to build it. Come on, somebody. And so he built an ark to the, to the salvation of his family. And the reason we're here today is because Noah had faith. You know how we know Noah had faith? Because he obeyed. Because faith is simply obeying God. And if you could just get that into your head, that if God said it, I'll believe it. Well, if you believe it, then you'll do it. I believe it, so I'll build it. Well, I'll build it my way. No spirit of Cain, don't build it your way. It's got to be 450 feet long. It's got to have three levels. It's got to be built with wood. There's got to be wood involved. Come on, there's got to be a cross involved, and you better pitch it, and not just on the outside or not just on the inside, but both matter. You're going to have to be holy on the inside, and you're going to have to be holy. On. I don't think it matters. I don't think I have to put pitch on the outside. I'll just put it on the inside. Go ahead and disobey and you'll drown with the rest of them. But if you're going to make it through the storm, you're going to have to have three levels. You're going to have to have the death, the burial, and the resurrection. And, and you can't put the window in the basement because light doesn't come from below. you got to put a window up in the top so that you know where your light and your help comes from. You don't get to put two doors in because there's only one way in. I said there's only one way in. There's only one door into this house, and it's Jesus anybody trying to put another door in the ark is a thief and a robber 
Don't you let somebody tell you there's another way than repenting of your sins. Don't you let anybody tell you there's another way other than baptism in the name of Jesus. Don't you let anybody come and tell you that you can't be, don't have to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Come on, this word is true in every man a liar. I said it's in the book. You gotta do it. Thank God for this journey of faith. Thank God for the journey of faith. And then the water falls from the sky and the earth opens. And we see one of the most beautiful pictures of God's grace in one of the ugliest pictures of God's judgment. It's 50 million corpses rot on top of water for a year until they decompose and the water finally backs away. The ark door opens and out come eight people who are then commanded to go throughout the earth and fill it with children. Spread out, he said. Fill the earth. But they refuse. They say, no, we're not going to do what you'd say. We're going to sin. And what is sin? Disobedience. Disobedience of the law. So they disobey. And instead of spreading out, they stay together. And they say, you know what we'll do? We'll build a tower. And we will make our name great. We, we, we don't want to be alone and we don't want to be unknown. Two greatest fears of man. To be alone and to be unknown. And they said, we know, we, we'll build a tower and we'll stay together and we'll become great and we'll make our name great. Come on. And God said, no, you're going to do what I told you to do. I'm going to cause mass confusion in your life because you disobeyed. Let me tell you why perhaps there's some confusion in your life. My life is so... Con I'll tell you why you've got mass chaos and confusion. It's simply because you're not obeying the word of God. But if you obey, come on. Uh, if you obey, uh, all of a sudden you might start understanding what's going on in your marriage. It's like we're talking two different languages. She's saying this and I, I'll tell you why you got sin. And sin is simply the disobedience of the law. So God said, now you're going to do what I say. He comes down and there's confusion. And then guess what happens? They spread out. God, When God says it's going to happen... It's going to happen. I said, when God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now, in Genesis 12, they have spread out across the earth. And man, at this point again, it's time. Many years have ticked on. There's been nations that have ra ra raised up, and, and they are following after their gods, and their different idols that they worship. And, and in Genesis chapter 12, this is where we find God. And he looks down again and finds the earth in, in disarray. Man, once again, living after his own desires and lust. But he cannot destroy the earth, for the promise that he gave Noah through the rainbow was that he would no longer destroy the earth with water. There would be no more floods. And so he says, you know what I will do? Uh, he said, that nation worships their God, and this nation worships their God, and those people are worshiping their God, and these nations are offering their children to, to their God. He said, I will have a people of my own. He said, so I will create a people, a nation of my own, and I will bless them. I'm going to bless them, but it ain't going to be a baby blessing. It's going to be a blessing so great that the nations of the earth will look at my nation and say, who is your God? I'm going to make them so jealous of God's people that they're going to want to be a part of it. I'm going to show my glory. Come on, you got to stop being ashamed of being a blessed people. you got to stop being embarrassed. It's part of the promise of who we are. Hallelujah. He said, but I need a man. I need a man that I can bless. He said so in Genesis 12. So the Lord said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country uh, from thy kindred uh, and from thy father's house. Hey, hey, Abe, let's go. I need you to leave everything and everyone. Leave all your family. Leave all your stuff. Leave your inheritance. Leave everything. Let's go. I don't know about you, but if God was to say that to me, my next question would be, where are we going? And God answered it. He said, I'll tell you. Just trust me. Well, I ain't going to go until you tell me where I'm going. You know what I'll do? I'll follow when I have a little bit of direction in my life. And God said, you're not going to know where you're going until you're willing to follow, knowing I am going to take you to a place that's better than where you are. Faith, the journey of faith that God is looking for is people that obey him even when they don't understand him. I don't know what God is doing. Then keep on obeying. Keep on obeying. It's to a land that he's going to show you. It's such a great land. Can you imagine if he'd have told him everything he would have, he would have gone through? He would have never left. You've got to trust that God. Come on, he's calling you. And if God says leave, obey. 
obey. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. He leaves Haran. He, he obeys God. However, there's a little bit of a blip here, a little bit of an error. And Lot, I'm sorry. And so Abram departed, verse 4, stay verse 4. And Lot went with him. Look at your neighbor and say, Lot went with him. God said, don't take nobody. But he took Lot with him. And the reason, and so Lot goes with him, and Lot's name means veil. He wasn't a spiritual man. He was a carnal man. But even though he was carnal, he was blessed. And he became very wealthy. The reason he was wealthy was because of who he's connected to. You can get connected to the right people, and the reason you're blessed is because of who you're connected to. Come on, somebody. And so he is now so blessed that his employees start fighting with his uncle's employees. And they are fighting, and they are in conflict. And, and, and Abram says, hey, bud, man, it's better if we split up. It'd be better if we just split ways because your business is going so great. And, 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 and God is, of course, he's blessed me so tremendously. Uh, why don't we just split ways? And, and Lot's like, all right, good plan, verse 10. And Lot lifted up his eyes. Ooh, sounds a lot like Eve. Eve lifted up her eyes and made a decision with her eyes. Come on, somebody. I said she made a decision with her eyes, not in prayer, come on, not spiritually, not with counsel, but she made it with, well, that looks good to me, and that, that, that feels good to me, and that tastes kind of like him to me, and that smells kind of like, 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 like him to me, but, but it's not, it's not, it's not the voice. You've got to hear from God, and when you hear from God, you obey God. That's the journey of faith. He lifts up his eyes and beholds the plain of Jordan. It's well watered. It looks great. It's wonderful. Verse 13 says, but the men of Sodom, young people look at that, the men of Sodom were wicked just because it looks good. Doesn't mean it's right. And wickedness can look good. Let me say that again. Just because it looks good doesn't mean it's right. I'll say it again, just because it looks pretty, just because she looks pretty, doesn't mean she's the right one. Just because he looks good, doesn't mean he's the right one. <laughs> Lot's wife will turn to a pillar of salt. His son-in-laws will burn in fire and brimstone. His daughters will take him and rape him, from which will come the Moabites and the Ammonites, the enemies of God's people, who will offer their children up as sacrifices to their false gods. What a, what a horrible, horrible thing. Who's to blame? Well, you could blame Lot. Lot should have never left. Best thing Lot could have done is say, no, the only reason I'm blessed is because of you. But really, the really the one to blame is Abram. When Abram got ready to leave, he should have said, nah, no, Lot, you, you, you can't come with me. But because he couldn't say no, come on. He cost Lot his family and his future, and he caused himself heartache beyond imagination. It is here, though, that even though Abraham, even though Abraham made an incredible move, he made a mistake, but what's beautiful is God did not give up on him. That's the story and the journey of faith, is that while he failed and he messed up, he, he was not forsaken by God. And so Abraham's journey continues, and you know the story. I'm going through it quickly. And finally, he is, he, is, uh, he is of age and getting old to the place where, where children are, are becoming less and less of an option. And Sarah, as you know, comes and she says, you know what? She says, you know what, hubby? She said, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a servant named Hagar. You, you, ought to, you ought to sleep with her and, and we can have a child. And, and that child, God, God needs our help. Come on. I know, I know the promise and I know, I know the word says this, but... God needs a little bit of our consulting and our, our advice. Uh, needs a little bit of our help. So, so we'll go ahead and just disobey. But you know what disobedience brings? It brings death. Uh, Ishmael is born. Uh, and there is conflict with, with Isaac who is born some years later when Abraham is 100 and Sarah is 90. And there is so much conflict between Ishmael and Isaac that, that Abraham has to make a decision. Can you imagine this, Dad? He has to kick his, his own son out of the house choosing between the promise and the one that he had made of his flesh it is this problem is all linked back to Abraham disobeying God's word 
if he would have just believed God, if he just would have been faithful. You say, well, Hezbollah and Hamas, and we're all talking about which Muslim terrorist is to blame. I'll tell you which one it is to blame. It all goes back to Abraham. Come on. It's the gap between the sin and the consequence. It had to happen. Eve ate of the fruit. Amen. She didn't instantly die because, or we would not be here. But because there was a gap between the consequence and the sin, we now sin more readily. But if the sin and the consequence of sin was prior to or at exactly at the same time, you wouldn't do the garbage you do. But that gap, that gap. And here you are. Let me just tell you, your sin and disobedience to God has consequences beyond you. You being disobedient, come on, to the word of God, young people, and moms and dads. It'll have consequences beyond your pew, beyond time. But God does not give up on him. Even though he failed, God did not give up on him. Because while he may have failed, the journey of faith kept him moving forward. He kept moving forward in this journey of faith. Until finally on, on 22 and 1 of Genesis, we come to the most famous because it is the final. The final test that Abraham will come up against. And it comes to pass after these things that God does test or tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, Behold, here am I. And he said, Take now thy son, thy only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell you. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. When did, when did Abraham get up? Did God tell him to get up early in the morning? God didn't give him a time, and God didn't give him a day. He said, Go kill your son. And Abraham, he, before the sun was up, he was packing his bag early in the morning. Now, if it had been me or if it had been you, we wouldn't have got up early in the morning. We'd have been, I need to take him on a hunting trip. I got to go to Disneyland. We got to get our final run into there. We got it all, and we'll do it right as the sun sets. I ain't doing it early. But, but, but he has journeyed now from chapter 12, and in 10 chapters uh, through his life, he has learned that every time I disobey God, I have disaster in my life. Uh, so I'm not going to delay. I'm going to get up early, and I'm going to do it. I'm not going to make the preacher beg me. He don't have to preach it three times. I don't need a personal invitation. I don't have to have a meeting about it. If I hear it, I'll do it. It. And that's the difference from 12 to 22. That's why there was, was no more test. He wasn't tested anymore because he finally learned. He passed the test. When the book says it, do it. When the word says it, do it. Do it, do it, do it. Don't let there be a delay between your obedience. Come on, in the word of God. Just do it. Well, I, I don't know. that You know, that's just his opinion. No, it's the Word of God. We don't come to church for entertainment. We don't come to church to hear Matthew Tuttle's opinions about the Bible. I, I'm sorry. I'm not up here giving my opinion. The desk is here, and God has appointed me as pastor to be the vessel through which he speaks his word into this generation. And when the man stands behind the desk, you ought to sit there as God is speaking to you. I'm a kotayara mashotokoyabaha. I said that God is speaking to you. And when God says you ought to get up and live right and do right, you ought to do it. You ought to do it. You ought to do it. That's just the way to do it at East Kate. Come on, that's the way we do it. Come on, if you can't obey God's word, you, you need to go somewhere where you're not in rebellion. You need to obey the word, obey the word, obey the word. And he saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac his son and clave the wood of the burnt offering and rose and went up into the place which God had told him. He did it exactly. Exactly. He didn't bring nobody else with him. He didn't add to. He didn't take away. He did it exactly the way God said. And Abraham said, finally they arrived to the place, the Bible says, of sacrifice. They see it in the distance. And he says to his young men in verse 5 of 22, abide ye here. He says, and I and the lad will go yonder. We're going to worship and come again. He said, we're going to first mention of the word worship, Genesis 22 and 5. What, what instruments did Abraham bring to his worship? Said, we need to take note. We need to find out if it was the drums, what track he had, 
Uh, we need to know if it, what kind of cymbals he was playing, uh, brother, brother Aaron. Come on, get, get the uh, what kind of organ, what kind of style, what what kind of lights did they have flashing? What brand fog machine did they have blowing fog? I, I need to know. Here's here's the instruments, and he took the wood that he was going to burn up, and he took the fire. Huh. Hmm, hmm, my, this doesn't sound like it's going to feel very good. And he took a knife. He said he took wood, fire, and knife. The first instruments in the first worship set was wood, fire, and a knife. Abraham didn't come to the worship set to get fired up. I said A Abraham didn't come to worship to get fired up. He came with fire in his hand. True worship doesn't have to be, let's worship, let's worship. Come on, everybody, get up. Well, you know, that's really not my song, and I'm really into the older stuff, and I kind of like this and that. And then, no, 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 no. Real worship comes with fire in its hand, saying I'm ready. What are we going to burn? I'm re I came on fire. I don't need you to fire me up. I brought... What would happen if you came into the house on fire, and she came on fire, and we all came... It would be an all-consuming fire. You don't need a fog show when you got fire. You don't need flashing lights when you got burning fire. Oh, come on, somebody. He said you're going to have some. I got to have, I got to have some, some fire. Then he, he had fire, young people, and he had, a, he had a knife. Why did he bring a knife to a worship set? Why did he have the knife? Why did he bring the knife? What was he going to do? Sacrifice? Yeah, say it like ugly language. Like he was going to kill. He was going to kill. Kill. What was he going to murder? You remember? What's he going to murder? His what? His son. His what? Son. His flesh. The first worship set came with fire and the concept I'm going to kill my flesh. This modern queer worship is not flesh killing. Get me an aisle roller and a runner. Well, why are you rolling? I'm killing my flesh. I brought a knife to the worship set. What's this? This is a knife to the worship set. What's all the shouting and running and running? It's a knife to the worship set. Your flesh needs a... Mm, I said your worship set needs a knife and your flesh needs to die. What is, what is it that you've said you won't do? Come on, what is it you said you won't do? What is it you said you wouldn't do in worship? You need to do it. What is it you've said? My pro, I'll never do that. Do it! Well, that doesn't really make me feel good. Perfect. That's exactly what's supposed to be happening. You're supposed to not feel good. You're supposed to. Everything that makes your flesh feel good ain't good. Drugs made your flesh feel good. Alcohol made your flesh feel good. Come on, somebody. And it wrecked your liver. Gambling made you feel good. Now you got no rent to pay. Come on. Drugs got you high. Woo, felt good. Come on, now you're sleeping in a tent or a box. Premarital sex, sex outside of marriage. Ooh, that feels good. Till you wake up with an STD and a broken family. Homosexuality, oh, it feels good until you've got AIDS. Come on, somebody. You've been doing what feels good your whole life. Stop sitting on a pew because worship doesn't feel good and realize if my flesh don't like it, that's probably what I need to do. Do something your flesh don't like. Do something your flesh hates. Worship, clap, shout, run, roll. Get into a flesh-killing frenzy. You, I've come to worship. I've come to worship God. Ah. Oh, you're just old-fashioned. Yeah, all the way back to Genesis 22 and 5. That's how old-fashioned the worship set at Eastgate is.
And if there's no pain, there's no gain. You don't go to the gym and, and, and be like, well, I'm not even sore. If you go to, if you go to gym, pay your membership, and you're never sore, you're going to stay an overweight chubby with your dad bod. <laughs> Only way you're going to look better is if it hurts. And if you're not going to make it hurt, stop paying for the membership. You are literally throwing your money in the garbage can. But if you're going to get the membership and pay the whatever you pay, why don't you go to the gym, work out, and make it burn so you can have some muscle to show for it? If you're going to come in and pay your tithe, put money in the offering plate, take a whole Sunday, you ought to make it burn. Let me see some muscles grow, some devils die, some spiritual maturity. Let's see something happen out of that. Mm, I'm in the house of God. I'm here and I came with a knife to grow in God. But for me to grow, come on, for God to get big, I got to get small. For him to increase, I got to decrease. So cut away, cut away. And Isaac said, Daddy, we got the fire, we got the wood. He said, we got the knife. He said, but where? where where's the lamb? He said, I, I see everything. But, 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 but the lamb. They were worshiping God without the lamb. They were willing to praise God without goosebumps. But he said, if you will worship me, God will provide. If you come with fire, and if you come with wood, and if you come with a knife, God will show up. God, let me, let me tell you, we cannot perform. I'm all about wonderful and perfect. We love to do a great job. But the choir and its excellence and brilliance, tracks, loops, and all that jazz is nothing compared to a, an angelic choir of hundreds of millions that sing with perfect pitch and harmony who, who in and of themselves can make music of themselves and here we stand with man-made instruments needed just to magnify our voices the angels need no magnification by electronics they are that wonderful and majestic and if you think that some way God is attracted to the majesty of what we do you are wrong let me tell you why God shows up in, the, in this beautiful song because of the hours of sacrifice that was put into preparation. He's not... Oh. That's why we don't get up here and perform without practice. That's why we don't get up here and sing without prayer. Because God doesn't respond to the cuteness and the coolness of our voices. He responds to the blood on the altar. He responds to the 7.30 getting here early, getting to a prayer room and getting into practice. God is not impressed by the majesty of eloquent sermons. He is drawn to the blood on an altar. So you've got to sacrifice. You've got to, don't preach a pretty sermon, but never get into a prayer room. You've got to have blood on the altar. And God will provide. God will show up. I said, God will show up. And he ain't going to send a substitute. He's going to show up himself. I said he will provide himself. He will be the lamb. I said he will be the, the lamb. A burnt offering. He ties up the boy and lays him on that altar. And the Bible says he lifted that knife. Verse 10, stretched his hand. He, stre he stretched. Why would you stretch? Max thrust. It wasn't, I'm going to poke him and hope he maybe lives through it. It was, I'm going to extend my fire. I'm going to get the max thrust. This knife's going to plunge to the depths of its ability. It's going to stab so deep, it'll be left. I can't, be, I can't even pull it out. He stretched because he didn't have a backup plan. This is it. I've learned. He's standing there. He says, I have learned. It would be better to have a dead son than disobey God. It would be better to have a dead dream than to disobey God. It would be better to have less money than disobey God. It would be better. It's just better for me if, if I obey. I said it's just better for me. 
He said, I've already tried. I brought my dad, and it cost me years. I let Lot, Lot tag along, and his grandsons are now my enemies. I went to Egypt, and I almost lost my wife. I had relationship with Hagar, and now my sons hate each other. Every time I've tried to do it on my own, every time I've tried to disobey God and his word, every time I compromise, all I brought was destruction into my life. So kill the boy. It must be better for me. Obedience is always better. Obedience is always better. The disaster of our lives comes when we disobey his word. The conflict in your life comes because of disobedience to the word of God. Obey, obey, obey. That's the journey of faith. And the angel of the Lord called from heaven and said, Abraham! Abraham. Yeah, God. Don't do it. Don't do it. Now I know. Now I know. I know now that you fear God because you didn't withhold your son because you obeyed me. There's a ram. He looks up his eyes. And he, he sees a ram called the thicket. And the Bible says he went over. And I can imagine as my, my mind's eye views this, this man as he's no doubt heaving in relief. Oh, God, I know you believed that God was going to raise him back up. But, man, the, the process was dangerous. Uh, and it was scary. He went over. He, he unwraps that, that, that ram from the thicket. And he lays him on that altar. He raises that knife without any hesitation. He sho sho shoves that knife into the heart of that animal. And the final cry of that animal is the blood begins to trickle down the sides of that altar. I can imagine as my eyes quickly shift from that, that bloody altar, I see a little boy. Yeah. Ropes still wrapped around his wrist and legs. Trembling with tears as he watches the drip of the blood from the altar of what should have been his death. And he says, thank God for the lamb. Thank God for that blood. Thank God for that blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God. Then he probably got to shouting, thank God for the blood. Thank God. And it not. How can you look at a cross that drips with Emmanuel's blood where the lamb who was God hangs upon you? You ought to know that every drop coming off that tree is your blood. Had it not been for the master who came as a servant, you would have been dead on a tree. So don't look at me silly and don't mock me hard when I lose my mind giving my God a hallelujah. Don't you don't you look at me funny or, or, or lift your nose up in the air. I've got to give him Your question ought not to be, why do you guys worship so radically? The question is, why do you not? I said, the question isn't why we worship. The question is, why are there only 20% of us worshiping radically? I thought you believed in the blood. When I think of the blood of Jesus, I said, when I think of the blood of Jesus, when I think of the goodness of Jesus, and all he's done for me, I'm sorry. I've got to give him praise. I've got to give him glory. What's funny about this story is I speed to a conclusion. Come to the music. It's a beautiful story, and if it was asked of you, Brother David, if they were said, if they said, take your son, you could, it would be hard. You would perhaps even hesitate. But you have a point of reference named Abraham. But Abraham didn't have a point of reference. For never before had anyone ever been asked to kill their son and 
never again had anybody been asked to kill their son. This was a first. I've never seen it. I don't have a point of reference. No one's ever gone through this cancer. No one's ever gone through this situation. No one's ever, no one's ever been through this trial. Come on, but the journey of faith says, I'll get up early in the morning and I'll obey God. I said, I'll obey God. I wondered, it's, I wondered why it was this particular. Why, I mean, uh, there could have been a lot of tests, Brother Gunter. But the murder of your son, you know, you could have come up with a lot of other things. Why this one? Perhaps it's linked to the culture of the day he lived in. The day that he lived in was one where the, the neighboring countries worshiped the God of Moloch. The Ammonites and Moabites, they, got, they were now worshiping gods and they would bring their children. Historians have now proven true by much research that the Bible is true that they would offer up their children. They would heat up the inward parts of a metal, metal idol whose arms were extended until they were hot and red and they would bring their infant children it was called the abortion of Abraham's age. Infanticide. And they would lay those children in the arms of their false gods. They would sizzle and offer them up. I don't know. But perhaps God looked down and said they'll offer their children for their God. Who gives them nothing. I just wonder. I wonder if you'd offer yours to me. I want to know. Do you love me as much as they love their God? Uh, I wonder if God looks down at 2023 and says, I see parents getting up early and driving all over America for Little League. I see parents and fans on the sides of stadiums screaming, Go team, go! Spending hundreds of dollars for tournaments and extracurricular. I see even people in church that'll miss church events to go to sporting events. And they say that I'm their God. I see them painting their faces and they'll dress, they'll dress any way to support their team. They get up and they dance. And for gold, they sit in traffic hours to go to a job. Work like a slave, give them the best hours and years of their lives. For what? Gold. I, I don't know who came up with the idea of giving God leftovers. I'll say it again. I don't know who came up with the idea that we just give God the time before our Sunday morning tea time. Our little tea off, you know. No, 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 no. What's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with with what? With all thy heart. With Oh, see, so y'all stopped at the first all. With all your heart, with your soul, and with that's not biology, that's mathematics. All, all, all. It's about the all. All. I want to know would you give me all? Would you give me all? Would you give me everything? Would you give me as much? If they'll shout and if they'll dance, if they'll worship, if they'll praise God, if they'll get out and praise their God that big, I just wonder, I just wonder if there's a people that'll give, give a day. They'll give an entire day on a Sunday and come into the house and I watched, I watched them worship their God and their games don't even win and their superstars don't show up when they're sick and they provide nothing for them but I have given them comfort. I've given them peace. I shed my blood. I offer up a sacrifice. I've provided for them when there was no way. I reached down in their marriage when their marriage was falling apart and I saved their marriage. I brought their kids out of the drug house. I saved them and healed their bodies. I wonder if they can shout as loud for me as they do for... I said, I wonder if the people of God can worship their God as great as the... <laughs> Look at your neighbor, say, we're gonna worship. 
Someone said, I heard a preacher say that the devil comes to church every Sunday just to check us out. Well, if he's coming to check us out, I say we put on a show. I say that the opposing team sees this team shouting for their God with more vigor, passion, enthusiasm as they do for their God. Come on, somebody. I said, I, I wonder, have you, have you ever seen them at a football game? Let me tell you what they don't do at football games. Shh, keep it quiet. No, louder. Go louder. 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 Oh, do you think we could cut out the fourth quarter? I mean, huh, it's just been a long game. No. No, come on, tie it up. Tie it up. Let's go into overtime. I know it's red. We're in overtime, and some of you are like, oh, God, i got to go. I've got so much, but I wonder if you could get as crazy about this team as you do their team. The journey of faith. That's the journey of faith. Can Here's what you need to do. Get with your neighbor. Say, neighbor, it's Sunday night and I've got my knife and I've got my fire. I've got my hallelujah and I've got my dance. I've got my amen ready. I've got my shout. It's been in here too long and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and get it out. I'm gonna go ahead and get as crazy about my God. As a matter of fact, I'm going for crazier. I'm going for wilder. I'm I'm going for weirder. I'm going for more radical. I'm going for crazier. If they can do it for gold, I'm not gonna work harder for gold than I am for God. I'm not gonna worship more the sports stars than I am the maker of the stars. I'm not gonna get louder for Hollywood than I am the one that died upon that sacred wood. I I've got to bless the Lord. I've got to give Him praise. I've got to lift my voice and say, Thank God for the blood. Thank God for the blood. Thank God for Calvary's cross. Thank God for Calvary's hill. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Woo! Yeah! Woo! Anybody feeling a little happy? I wonder if I got anybody, just be honest. The church house, you've been a little weary lately. Just raise your hands, I've been a little weary. All right, come on up to the front. You're about to get victory. There's a solution for your weariness. It's in the Bible. They shall run and not grow weary. Weariness, that's just biology of Bible. When you get weary, you don't give up. You get up. When you get tired, you don't sit down. You actually go to a higher rock. When you're overwhelmed, you go up, not down. The solution to overcoming weariness is not some time off. What it is, is some time in. Get your neighbor, clear the path. We're going to go, this is the direction we run at Eastgate. And I promise you that by the time you get to right there, that camera on the live stream, you're going to feel strength come back into your body. I said, and then the second half, the, you're going to be speaking in tongues. And God is going to give you so much strength for they shall run and not grow weary. I'm not stopping. I'm about to faint. Don't put a chair behind me. Get my feet going, cause they shall walk. <laughs> and not faint, get me walking. Keep me a running. Get me to leaping. Keep me to dancing. Oh, you need a little triumph? Clap your hands. You need a little victory? Shout unto the Lord. They're linked together. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. Whoa. There's victory in the house on a Sunday night. We came, we might as well get it. We came, we might as well do it. Yeah. And so on. Clap your hands, make a joyful noise. Blow the trumpet and shout. Come on, man. Pray that it's 
distracted by people's opinions and just speaking in tongues so loud you confuse hell and all his imps. Yeah, he brought enough confusion into my family. I'm going to return the favor to the adversary. You're not fighting flesh and blood. It's principalities and powers. There's rulers, strongholds. That's it. Find somebody. Begin to work choice with them. You ought to shout till you got no shout left. You ought to dance till the dance is empty. You ought to clap till your hands burn. 